Welcome to Monograph Matters. I'm talking today with Kim Bard, lead author of the SRCD monograph on joint attention in human and chimpanzee infants in varied socio-ecological contexts. This discussion addresses how the authors decolonized the study of joint attention. In your monograph, you talk a lot about the importance of decolonizing the study of joint attention. What does it mean to decolonize joint attention and how did you go about doing that in your work? Really interesting question and very pertinent. Um, it was important for us to take a phenomenon of joint attention and look at it as if, well, in fact, we were looking at it in infants who lived under different kinds of settings, different um, ecological pressures and different cultural expectations. Um, and so as we went along, we realized that we had these five steps to decolonizing joint attention, to look at it, look at one-year-olds from a variety of cultural settings, to look at how their development um, was different across these different settings, and then to actually make a definition that didn't prioritize one cultural setting or one ecological setting or one species. We wanted a definition that would allow for this inclusive view. And then we use that definition, of course. It was really important, as I said earlier, that we looked at multiple groups from diverse settings of humans. And we also looked at multiple groups from diverse settings of chimpanzees. Because part of what um, we wanted to address was the theory, the developmental theory and the evolutionary theory of social cognition. So we wanted to to see if there were differences in joint attention when we looked at naturally occurring joint attention in multiple groups of humans and multiple groups of chimpanzees. A final step in the decolonization process, however, is when we interpret, we have to be really careful not to allow biases to creep in. So we want to give equal weight to the findings from each of our groups without prioritizing any particular group. And how do you go about doing that as an author to, to inhibit your own perspective and your own biases that we know are always so present in our work? Well, in a way, I guess I've been preparing for that for a long time because I've always been fighting against, you know, that the chimpanzees aren't as good as um, Western middle-class human infants. And so there are things that chimpanzees can do that they're better than many Western middle-class human infants, but probably things that Western middle-class human infants can do better than chimpanzees, but they may not be representative of the whole entire species. So you have to be careful, you have to be wary, and now we have guidance on the things that we need to make sure we don't prioritize one group over another, that we don't um, pretend, that we don't assume that what we think we know that's based in weird samples is the norm or the gold standard. And to be careful that we you know, give equal credit, equal um, consideration to those ethno theories and developmental perspectives that are important in each of our groups and assume that the infants are adapting appropriately to their cultural expectations. So when we do that, we really do fight against any natural inclination that we have to say, oh, no, no, Western middle class is the best. It's one way, but it's not the only way and not necessarily the best way for everybody. Thank you. I really hear that combination of the developmental perspective and the evolutionary perspective and the cultural perspective. It seems like you really nicely blended those perspectives in your work. Read more about this topic in the monograph issue, Joint Attention in Human and Chimpanzee Infants in Varied Socio-Ecological Contexts, by Bard, Keller, Ross, Hewlett, Butler, Boyson, and Matsusawa. If you liked this video, consider watching our Monograph Matters playlist. For additional resources related to this and other issues of the Monographs of the Society for Research and Child Development, please visit monographmatters.srcd.com dot org.